Hello, and welcome to Book Circle. I'm Earl Weyenberg. This time we conclude our reading of Aunt Jenny and the Delayed Quest by Jim Burroughs. Aunt Jenny, Sasha, and the others have returned to Aunt Jenny's home in the Winslow Estates, in Winslow Cottage, coming through the magic mirror. Very much surprising, an old student of Aunt Jenny's Sandra. Sandy, exclaimed both Jenny and Sasha. You're back, replied Sandy. She was standing and leaning over to look into the camera. Her attention drifted away from them down and to the right. Sasha and Jenny recognized the sounds of a mouse moving on its pad. After a few seconds, Sandy's eyes grew wide and she grabbed a chair and sat down with a thump. Through the mirror? You, she stopped and stared slack-jawed out at them. You caught us, Sasha replied and strode over to sit in the chair in front of Aunt Jenny's computer. How, how, replied Sandy, it's a long story. What are you wearing? A very long story. Aunt Jenny leaned over Sasha's shoulder. Sandy, Sandra, yes, Aunt Jenny, did you rearrange my office? Yes, ma'am. Good. Why? So I could monitor the hall and your bedroom for activity? And the office, of course. Good. So you thought there might be some? Activity? Yes. But you... How did you... It's all right, Sandy. We'll explain it all. Is anyone else watching? Was anyone else notified when motion was detected? Asked Sasha. No, ma'am. Her eyes shifted a little in Sasha's direction. No, she added. But a lot of people know that we were missing, asked Sasha. Yes, the whole school, the police, your father, everybody. Sasha reached up and tapped her finger on the corner of the screen where the date and time showed. Sunday, September 2nd, 1327. Aunt Jenny laid her hand on Sasha's shoulder and nodded. I bet they're all pretty worried. You said my father. Have you spoken with him? Yeah, he's um, pretty intense, Sasha chuckled. With me missing? I'll bet. Hella intense. No kidding. Phew! Look, if you've spoken to him, you'll get why I want to talk to him before anyone else knows, right? Uh, yeah, I don't think I'd want to be in his way when he hears where you are. Right. So, look, can you keep all this to yourself, at least until I get to talk with him? Then, like, first thing, we'll tell you all about it. I... I guess so. Yeah, sure. Uh, Jenny leaned in. In fact, Sandy, how would you like to come by now? Sure, Aunt Jenny, I'll be right over. The window vanished as she hung up. Sasha turned to Aunt Jenny and asked, Why'd you ask her to come over? She's a senior now, and I could tell she was in the dorms, so she's less than a mile away. You know Sandy. There's no way she could keep from telling someone. Better we talk to her face to face sooner rather than later. Now let's call the Major. Is your phone working? They both took out their cell phones and checked. Nope. Dead or out of charge, said Sasha. Mine's working, sort of, but no signal. I could call from the computer, Sasha suggested. Voice or video? What's your gut tell you? I don't know. Maybe video? Hey, guys, she said to Drum Thortle and the professor, could you step back in the corridor out of the picture? They looked a bit confused. I'm going to um, orb my father with this, she indicated the computer. Could you stay around the corner where it can't see you? Yes, of course, replied the professor, and the two stepped out and down the hallway a few feet. I'll go make tea and wait for Sandy. Why don't you boys come with me, suggested Aunt Jenny, and led them into the kitchen. Sasha removed her helmet and coif and set them aside. I probably should have done that before talking to Sandy, she said to no one in particular, as she sat down at the computer. Big Tom jumped up and made himself comfortable in her lap. 
She opened the app and called her father. Sasha, where are you? Are you okay? What happened? The questions burst forth from him before she could say a word. Papa, Papa, I'm okay. Everything's fine, really. Where have you been? He demanded. It's a long story, Papa, and I want to tell you the whole thing. Can you come here? I'm at Aunt Jenny's, Miss Winston's, Wingate Cottage, by the school. I know where it is. Do you need help? I just need you, Papa, really. It's not an emergency, but I'd really like to see you right away. Are you nearby or off traveling? She knew the answer. She could see that he was in his office at home, less than a half an hour away. I'm in town. I can come right over. You're sure that you're all right? Absolutely, thanks. See you in a bit, he hung up. Sandy joined the others in the kitchen. The major's on his way, she told them as she sat down at the table. Aunt Jenny poured her a cup of tea. We could hear some of that from out here, said Jenny. Not too surprising, given that we've been gone for four months. I am so not ready for this, Sasha said after a while. Well, here comes your practice round. Oh, asked Sasha just before there was a knock at the door. Come in, Sandy. I unlocked it. The door burst open, and in came a blonde, out-of-breath teenager. Take it easy, Sandy, Aunt Jenny told her. Breathe. Sit down and breathe. Have some tea. Instead, after catching her breath, Sandy walked down the hallway to where the mirror stood and rested her hand on the glass. How did you... She began as Aunt Jenny and Sasha caught up with her. I rewound the video. You all came out of the mirror. I saw it. You were clearly in front of the bedroom door frame in the far edge of the mirror. And it moved. It rocked back and forth a little as you burst out. Where have you been? How did you do that? It's okay, Sandy, Aunt Jenny assured her as the girl turned back around to face them. Sandy took one look at Sasha and the torrent of questions started back up. What happened to you? You're huge. You're way taller than you were last spring. And is that a sword? Well, of course it is. What's with the sword? And that's armor. Why are you wearing chain mail? And who are the guys in the kitchen? Sasha grinned widely, crossed her arms, and leaned back to wait for a break in the questions. Sandy stopped and put a hand over her own mouth as if to hold back the torrent. Well, the short form is that we went to the same places as Little Jenny. You know, Little Jenny's journey to Fairyland and the rest. Aunt Jenny was supposed to get a thingy from her great-aunt Jenny half a century ago or thereabout and go on a quest and save the world and stuff. But it was delayed until this year, and I kind of went along for the ride by accident. Shut up. Fairyland? You went to goddamn Fairyland? Oops, so sorry, Aunt Jenny. You went to fracking Fairyland with, like, fairies? Real fairies? Sasha laughed and sighed. Yes, and Jinistan with genies, and Dreamland with dead hunks, and all sorts of places. Come back to the kitchen and meet some of my friends. One of them's a dwarf, not a little person like Peter Dinklage, a dwarf like Thorin or Biffer, Boffer, and Bomber. Sandy followed Sasha and Aunt Jenny back to the kitchen. Sandy, Sasha began, I'd like you to meet Dromothortle of High Dwarogard. Drummer, this is Sandra Smith. We call her Sandy. Pleased to meet you, Miss Sandy, said the dwarf, sticking out his hand. Sandy took his hand. Pleased to meet you, sir. And this is Professor Morris. He has one of those flying cars everyone was promised. You'd love it. But you don't have to take our word for it. Or perhaps you don't. Let's see. Aunt Jenny reached into her bag for her cell phone. The first thing she encountered was little Dickens, who was a bundle of excitement, so she took the kitten out and set her on the floor. The cat ran once around the room and then off to the bathroom and her litter box. Proper litter, not any of those yucky leaves, Aunt Jenny laughed before reaching again for the phone. Here, with any luck, it still works and the pictures are still on it, said Jenny. She turned it on, navigated to the Photos app, and started to show Sandy the pictures and videos she had taken in Irum, Ilum Crown, and the Shattered Isle. Shut the f front door, exclaimed Sandy. An angel? You met a fracking angel? Actually, she's a peri, like a Persian fairy or something. She's from just outside Jinistan. Oh, well, I can see that would make all the difference in the world, Sandy replied. She has wings. God... 
gosh darn wings. And that's the flying car, pointed out Aunt Jenny. You really were in another world. Yes, we were, Sandy, said Jenny, and we need to keep that very quiet. It could cause a lot of trouble for a lot of people. So you understand? Sandy sighed but nodded. I get it. Police, FBI, and that would be just the beginning. The school would suffer. It would be a mess. We knew you could keep this a secret, right, Sandy? Jenny looked seriously at the young woman, who was clearly struggling to take it all in. I hear a car, said Sasha, looking up at the kitchen clock. It's probably the Major. Making one last check of her appearance, she stepped to the door and opened it just as her father was about to knock. The Major, Zalik J. Levin, was not the sort to be often taken by surprise. A former Marine, known for his situational awareness, constant readiness, and casual effectiveness, he was used to being in command and prepared. For once, he stood dumbstruck. Though muscular and imposing in appearance, he was actually only a bit above average height, a little more than five foot ten. As a result, he was completely surprised to find himself staring decidedly up into his daughter's eyes. It was clearly her, with his auburn hair and green eyes in the soft curves of her mother's face, but the slouching teenager he'd known was replaced by a tall, alert warrior woman who looked completely at home in chainmail with a sword at her hip. Papa, she said, beaming. Sasha, where have you been? What's happened? Then, having voiced his astonishment and uncertainty, he was once again himself. His gaze swept the room, cataloging the occupants, identifying potential threats and familiar faces. A lot, sir. Come in. Let us tell you about it. She stepped aside, leaving no one behind her, facing everyone in the room, just far enough from surrounding objects that nothing would interfere with drawing her sword. He noticed this with a bit of pride. She gestured invitingly, smoothly and gracefully. He couldn't help but smile as he strode in. He crossed the room to take up a position nearly as secure as his daughter's. He was at high alert, but less worried than he'd been minutes before, despite the oddity of the situation. Ms. Winston, Ms. Smith, he greeted them with a short nod. These are Professor Morris and my companion Drumthortle, Papa, said Sasha. The Major nodded to each. J. Levin, he said. Everyone calls him the Major, Sasha explained. So what's all this about, Sasha? Where have you been? He asked, a bit of tension sneaking into his voice. It's a long story, and we should get comfortable. But in short, like Aunt Jenny's great-aunt Little Jenny, we've been in fairyland. We stepped or fell through a magic mirror, and I've been learning how to protect her and myself, though that doesn't really do the story justice. The Major's jaw tightened, and he frowned. Then, after a few heartbeats, relaxed. That answer is only slightly more ridiculous than the notion that you grew five or six inches over the summer after vanishing from a locked house. I'd have said it was more like four, maybe five inches, she replied with a half smile. Can I get you something to drink, Major? offered Aunt Jenny. Coffee, tea, beer, bourbon? A double, please, he replied, turning back to his daughter. He said, so what's with the sword? It's said to have been made by the same smith who forged King Arthur's. It has stood me well. And your teacher is wearing a crown? Which I got from an elven queen, a dwarven smith, kings of the genies and serpent folk, and a peri, a Persian fairy. It aids me in doing magic, as well as in symbolizing the uniting of several peoples, said Aunt Jenny, handing the major his bourbon. As your daughter said, it's a long and involved story. Shall we retire to the comfort of the living room for its telling? And that's how Aunt Jenny resumed the delayed quest and became Queen of the Glassy Isle and the last Queen of Avalon. It was, however, only the beginning of Aunt Jenny's journeys. The end of Aunt Jenny's first journey. But... We also get a look at how the whole affair appeared from our side, 
Earthside, ordinary life, well, as ordinary as it's going to get. Missing persons. Lieutenant Miller of the Winston Police arrived at Wingate Cottage to find Gus Statler, the campus security officer for the Winston Academy for Girls, waiting for him with a bespectacled blonde teenager, probably one of the school's students. Okay, Gus, you better read me in. What's up? He asked, taking out his notepad. So, Lieutenant, you know about the missing student, Alexandra Levin? Well, sir, it looks like she's not the only one missing. Miss Jennifer Winston, the resident of this cottage here, appears to have vanished with her. Vanished, Gus? Yes, sir, that's the best description we can come up with. We? Miss Smith and I, she discovered the second disappearance and the evidence connecting the two. The lieutenant turned to the girl, taking full note of her for the first time. She was, on the whole, rather nondescript, a schoolgirl in the Winston Academy uniform, straw blonde hair pulled back in a ponytail, eyeglasses that he could only assume were as unfashionable today as they would have been when he was a kid. And you are? he asked. Sandy. Sandra Ann Smith, sir. I'm a junior at the school and kind of Aunt Jenny's, uh, Ms. Winston's IT person. I take care of her computers, network, phone, and stuff, and I install her doorbell. Her doorbell? Yes, sir, it's a virtual doorbell. It rings on her phone and lets her answer the door from anywhere in the world. It has a camera, and she can see who's at the door on her phone. I see. And this is important? Yes, sir. Maybe you should start at the beginning. Okay. You know that Sasha, Alexandra Levin, went missing sometime on Tuesday, May Day, right? <clears throat> yes, I took the official missing person report myself yesterday from the headmistress. Winston, Massachusetts is a small town with a small police force, so Lieutenant Miller found himself wearing many hats. Today, he was the closest thing they had to a detective, and yesterday he'd been doing morning desk duty. Well, she's part of Aunt Jenny's Friday book club, and I hadn't seen her, Aunt Jenny, since Sasha disappeared. That's not unusual, not seeing her for a couple of days. She retired about a year ago, and we still see her walking around campus, or for things like book club, but not every day. Anyway, I didn't know if we were going to have book club because of Sasha, and prom besides, I promised I'd install a new backup disc in her NAS, so I skipped out of study hall and walked here to see her. The lieutenant paused in his note-taking and nodded for her to continue. Well, I got here and rang the bell, and she didn't answer, which is really odd, because like I said, it rings on her phone, and she can answer from just anywhere. I was kind of wondering if she was okay, and besides, I had the disc to install, so I let myself in. You have a key? Oh, no, sir, I used my phone. I have an app. It lets me manage her net and IoT devices. I can do most stuff from anywhere I have net access, but you can't actually install a new disc without being there. Well, I could have added more cloud storage, but the idea was to expand the local storage. I use a 321 backup scheme. She paused. But you don't care about that, do you? I don't think so. Is it pertinent to the disappearances? No, sir, just that I used the app to get in, and then later to check the video logs. But I'll get to that. You want it all in order, right, sir? Miller nodded. So I went in. Nothing looked out of place. I saw a handbag and a book on the kitchen table and some stuff on the table in the corridor, but I didn't recognize them, not yet. I'll get back to them, all in order. Anyway, I took the disc back to her office. It's down the hall across from her bedroom. I was about to add the disc when it started bugging me about her not answering the doorbell. Maybe the system was down. So I went and checked the video logs. They go back three days. Well, they're backed up, so you can recover anything that was ever recorded. But without going to the backups, it's just three. Right, you don't need to know this, do you? I, again, I don't think so. If we do, we can come back to this. What did you see? Well, it started without Jenny leaving in the morning, on May Day. She had Rudy and Big Tom with her. Those are her dog and cat. They go on walks with her. She left at about 9.30, 9.27 a.m., really, the next recording was an hour and a half later. It was the letter carrier, Pat, who had a package to deliver. Pat agreed to meet Aunt Jenny up the hill at Windy Hill Farm. That was Pat's next stop, and near where Aunt Jenny was when she answered the door. 
over her phone at about 11, 1058 actually. The next recording is only five minutes later. Sasha shows up and knocks on the door. I only configured it to notify Aunt Jenny if the doorbell was rung, not for every time the camera detects motion. Maybe I should, oh, never mind. Uh, so when no one answers, Sasha curls up in that chair over there. Aunt Jenny's got really comfortable lawn furniture. We often have book club out here under the trees. The lieutenant took a moment to give the chair the once over, then motioned for Sandy to continue. The next log is triggered by Sasha setting her book down just before Aunt Jenny comes into the picture. Aunt Jenny's carrying the package from Pat and they all go into the house. There's no cameras in the house. Well, her iMac has a webcam, but I put a sticky over it. So that's the last recording of either of the minute. But after watching the videos, I realized it was Sasha's handbag and book on the table, the Oracle glass by Sandy's side. But you don't want to know that. Is that when you called Gus? Almost, Sandy paused and bit her lip. I should have called him or you right away, but I poked around a little more. Well, I didn't poke. I didn't touch anything after that, but I did go check the stuff on the sewing table in the hallway and the things on the kitchen table. Aunt Jenny opened the package in the hall and Sasha laid down her stuff in the kitchen and then they disappeared. Then I called security. Should I have called the cops, the police, instead? Maybe, but one or the other was certainly the right thing to do, Miller answered. Is there anything more? Nothing important. Well, maybe. There are a couple of pieces of paper along with the box. One of them looks like it was written in code. I wasn't going to touch anything, so I'm not sure. Okay, and you, Gus, what have you got to add? Well, as you know from the headmistress, uh, Sasha, Miss Levin, wasn't back by lights out on Tuesday, so we, the school, started looking into it Wednesday morning. But we couldn't do a formal missing persons report until yesterday, 48 hours after she was last seen. We were focused on Miss Levin, and no one took note of Ms. Winston's absence until Miss Smith called me. That's not too unusual. While she and her family are important to the school and the town, she is retired, and the estate isn't part of the school, even though the trust owns them both. Miller nodded. So what did you find when you got here? Did you go in, touch anything? Yes and no. I went in. Like I said, the trust owns the cottage, and I work security for the school, and so the trust. So it's not trespassing, but it could be a crime scene, so I didn't touch anything. I wouldn't recommend going in uninvited normally, but with one or two missing persons involved, I'll buy your reasoning. I suspect the chief would agree. I did see enough to convince me that some of what's in there might be evidence, so I called you. Legally, I can enter and give you permission to look around, but I don't want to do anything on my own. Good man. Shall we check it out then? Yes. You'll need to stay out here, Sandy, Miss Smith. Entering to do your IT thing can be assumed to be authorized, but now, while we investigate... I understand, sir. Sandy sat down in one of the lawn chairs and amused herself with her phone while the two men went into the cottage. Gus guided the policeman through the house, pointing out the book and handbag that Sasha had been carrying in the video. Miller went through the bag and found Sasha's wallet, ID, and money. A hallway led from the kitchen to the back of the cottage. Partway down, there was a small sewing table, and at the far end stood a full-length mirror in an antique wooden stand. On the table, there sat a cardboard box, a bit of twine, and an outer brown paper wrapper addressed to Jennifer Winston, Wingate Cottage, Winston, Massachusetts. Next to the box was an antique jewelry box and two pieces of paper, one a full letter-sized sheet, the other a small folded note. This tray fits so snugly into the case it might constitute a false bottom or hidden compartment, observed Miller. And this folded letter would fit in nicely, added Gus. No sign of any other contents. Nope. They unfolded and read the letter. Jenny, I owe you a tremendous apology, one I was too ashamed to make in life. This box and what it contains should have been your inheritance all those years ago when my Aunt Jenny, your great aunt, died. It seems so petty now, but I was always jealous of you, of how close you two Jennies were. 
That jealousy made me do a shameful thing. As executor, I should have passed this on to you, but you were away at school, and at first I told myself I'd just hold it until you returned on break. But then, as time went by, somehow I decided to keep it for myself. Joseph's job took us out west, and I took it with me. I almost gave it to you when you married your young doctor, but forgot, or so I told myself, and left it behind. When your doctor Tom took sick, and you were so good and selfless caring for him, I could not bring myself to admit how petty I had been. The guilt only got worse with time, and so, coward that I am, I am sending it to you in my will. The package has been kept by the lawyers since shortly after the towers fell, and they have instructions to find you if you are no longer at Wingate when I die. Aunt Mary, November 15th, 2001. Nope, I don't think this was in the hidden compartment. It's a cover letter for the whole thing, said Miller. I agree. That means that either the little note was there, or what was in there was gone along with whatever valuable inheritance the box contained. They opened the note and found that as Sandy had been right. It consisted of just eight nonsense words, seven on one line and one more on a second line, followed by the letter J. That's a little short to be the secret contents. I agree. They continued to search the house and found nothing that looked out of place for the home of a widowed retiree with her two cats and a dog. The back door and all the windows were latched from the inside. Anyone who left would have had to go out the front door. They went back out to speak with Sandy Smith. So, can I get a copy of the videos from the doorbell? asked the policeman. Me too, if that's okay, Lieutenant. I was just downloading them to my phone so I could send them to you both, and I noticed something odd. Oh? Yeah, the last few videos are Pat delivering more mail, a policeman ringing the be bell, and then us arriving. The men nodded. But between them and Aunt Jenny and Sasha going in, there's another one that I skipped earlier. There aren't any people in it. These things get triggered by extraneous movements sometimes. Really heavy winds swaying the trees, birds and animals, passing cars, that sort of thing. I figured it was just one of those. But it wasn't. No, what triggered it was the movement of shadows cast by some light inside. The laced curtains blur the shadows too much to know what they're shadows of. But they are odd somehow, asked the lieutenant. Only in that they exist. I've never seen shadows there to trigger the camera before. And, well, she pointed at the open cottage door, there are no obvious lights to cast the shadows. All three stood quiet, looking through the door, across the kitchen, and down the corridor to the mirror. Not a light or fixture to be seen. So I played with it with the sound on. Here, listen, it's a little muffled, but I enhanced it. No, cried a woman's voice after a second, followed immediately by a thumping sound as if someone stumbled or tripped, but no large crash of them completely falling down. What the hell, came the voice of a young woman or teenager. Langu the older voice started and was cut off. Fifteen seconds of silence followed, and the clip ended. Do you recognize the voices? asked Miller. Yes, sir. That was Aunt Jenny and Sasha. And the door was closed? I think so, sir. That rectangle of light has to be the window in the door and the lace curtain over it and shadows of someone moving inside. And none of the subsequent videos show them leaving? No, sir. They just vanished. And we know what happened to them after that. Thank you, and I hope you've enjoyed this reading of Aunt Jenny and the Delayed Quest.